Railway modelling can be a deeply satisfying hobby, but it can also be expensive, particularly if you're buying new, ready-to-run rolling stock and locomotives, with prices often getting into the hundreds of pounds, and that understandably puts a lot of people off. But the good news is, it can be done for a much tighter budget by tapping into the vibrant second-hand market and buying older models that have been languishing in somebody's loft or garage for years. And here's my latest acquisition, a mainline model railways class 45, which I picked up from eBay for not very much at all. Of late 70s vintage, it very much predates the digital era, which finally brings us to the point of this video, which is how to fit a DCC chip into an older locomotive. But first, and this is very much for people who don't know, look at the key differences between DC and DCC. With DC, direct current, the electricity that runs the train's motor is supplied directly to the rails and controlling the voltage of that current makes the train go faster or slower. At zero volts the train is stationary and at about 12 volts we hit maximum speed. Switching the polarity changes the direction. So the schematic is pretty simple. The direct current goes straight to the rails and with the wheels in contact with the rails onto the motor via the pickups and just two wires. DCC or digital command control works differently and it's important here to point out that they're not compatible with each other. Although my layout which is designed primarily for DCC is simple enough to switch over to DC for testing trains for instance. Perhaps the biggest difference with DCC is that the voltage to the track is constant. It's about 15 volts and also AC rather than DC. As the name suggests, the final control of the voltage to the motor is down to a digital microprocessor installed in the locomotive, which has its own address or number. And the same controller can be used to control multiple trains by punching in each one's individual number. The first one continuing on the same speed until instructed otherwise. And because the voltage to the track is constant, DCC offers extra features like lights. So looking at the wiring diagram again, we can see it's pretty similar, but with alternating current instead of direct current, going to the track and then onto the wheels. But instead of going straight to the motor, our wires go to the microchip, which will decode the instructions from the controller before sending the variable direct current onto the motor. And here's the chip I'll be using. They come in all shapes and sizes from different manufacturers, but my fairly basic Hornby Select system can be a bit picky, so I stick to the Hornby ones. I've also selected the most basic one for this video, the 4-pin one, which is for motor control only, as it will most clearly demonstrate how to do the wiring. As soon as it's out of its anti-static bag, I like to wrap it in insulating tape. The risks of static electricity damage to microprocessors are somewhat overstated, but it is good not to touch the surfaces of the components. And my little insulating tape cocoon will remove any risk and make handling all the more simple. So with the DCC chip made ready, I just need to get it into the loco. Fortunately, models of this era tend to be relatively easy to get into. And my mainline 45's body is held on in a very similar way to other diesels from Lima and Hornby so the same method can be used for removal. I'm starting by snipping an old gift card, redeemed of course, into quarters. Old membership cards and credit cards can also be used, but this gift card is a little bit thinner and just as rigid, so it's easy to slide between the body sides and the chassis. The body is held on by four lugs under each of the driver's doors, and our four bits of gift card need to be slid down the side from the middle of the body where it's a bit more pliable, down to the driver doors, where they can gently prise the body off of those lugs, one at a time, until all four have been released, and the body can be gently eased upwards away from the chassis. Now we can see the simplicity of the DC wiring, with the pickups from these four wheels connected directly to the motor brushes by the red and the black wires. Before we get on to the next stage, a quick reminder of our mission, which is to reroute the black and red wires to the chip 
rather than to the motor, which will get some new orange and grey wires from the chip. Our loco is very far from being DCC ready, so the first thing to do is to snip off that plug. Our chip is a motor control only, so it has four wires, black, red, orange and grey, and we are going to need to strip off a little bit of the installation for each. A while back I invested in some precision wire strippers, which has really paid off for jobs like this, as it is really easy to just end up with a single strand of cable in those fine wires, and they're quite short so we don't get many chances to try again if we do strip off too much. With the insulation removed, I'm coating the ends with a little bit of solder, which will make the final joint quicker and easier to do. Putting the prepared chip to one side, I can unsolder the red and the black wires from the motor, just using the tip of the soldering iron. I'm going to leave the blob of solder on the contacts, but I'm going to snip off the ends of the wires and strip down the insulation to a nice shiny piece of wire, ready to join to the wires for the decoder. Those joins are going to need insulating, and the best thing for this is heat shrink, although you'll have to buy it from somewhere else, since the sad closure of Maplin. Just cut a short length, enough to cover the exposed part of the joint, and slide it down the wire, out of the way for now. Although not in any way DCC ready, our loco does have a convenient place to put our decoder. And with the small piece of double-sided sticky pad, we can attach it to that nice flat area on top of the motor, which almost seems to be designed for the job. It also means that even though our decoder wires are very short, they won't require any extension to reach the contacts for the brushes. And taking great care not to pull the wire off the chip, I'm gently easing it round so the end is over the blob of solder on the contact, which we can remelt with the tip of the soldering iron. With the grey decoder wire, in place of the old black DC wire, we can do the same thing with the orange, soldering it to where the red wire used to go. With the output cables from the chip in place, we can set about joining the black and red input cables to the existing wiring. Now is the last chance to put that heat shrink on before lining up the exposed ends of each wire and soldering them together. I'm steadying the ends of the cables with a third hand tool and it only takes a little extra solder in addition to the coating I put on earlier to make a neat join. And that's all the soldering done, but before going any further, let's put it to the test and make sure it all works. We need to give the chip its unique number which we do by holding down the select button. And when LA appears on screen, we can key in the number we want to use. After pressing select again, the controller will flash three times to indicate the instruction has been accepted. And we can now control the train forwards and backwards. Confident that everything is working fine, we can set about reassembly. First, let's slide those little bits of heat shrink over the exposed joins to make sure they're fully insulated. As the name suggests, a little bit of heat will shrink them around the cables. I'm using the sides of the soldering iron rather than the tip, just on the ends of the heat shrink until it's shrunk enough to hold in place. The original wiring was quite long and I've kept it like that, just in case I want to modify anything in the future, like switching to a chip with more functions. But I do want to dress it and tidy it up which I'm doing with a couple of straps of insulating tape, which will also hold the polystyrene insert in place. And with one final test of the assembled chassis, I can replace the body, lining it up and lowering it over the chassis, gently easing it downwards until it reaches those lugs, over which the body can be clipped with the assistance of that gift card we used earlier. So with a little bit of technical know-how and some basic soldering skills, my old peak can join my digital fleet. I hope I've shown in this video that updating old locos is not difficult and needn't be expensive. In the near future, I'll be adding further DCC content, including how to add lights to your locomotives and coaches, all without spending a fortune. So don't forget to click on that subscribe button. And thanks for watching.